Welcome to Bitch Talk, booze interviews straight from the heart of San Francisco. I'm Erin. That's Ange. Hi. That's Char. Hello. You can find us at bitchtalkpodcast.com where you can sign up for our monthly e-news. For behind the scenes videos and two minute clips of our interviews, head to our YouTube channel and subscribe. You can find us every other Thursday morning at 9.30 a.m. at bff.fm. And if you like what you hear, rate and subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. For the love of God, do it. It really helps. What up, bitch talkers? We are flashing back to a conversation we had early in the year. Was it like January, you guys? I think it was Sundance, right? Yeah, it was Sundance Mm -hmm. of this year. Um, To a couple of our favorite directors, Betsy West and Julie Cohen, um, they previously directed one of our favorite documentaries, RBG, um, which, you know, whatever. We have nothing to say except go see it if you haven't and RIP to RBG. But um, their latest documentary is called My Name is Polly Murray. And um, I'm just going to read what the description is because it's easier than me trying to think about how to describe this film in Polly Polly Murray. But it's 15 years before Rosa Parks refuses to give up her bus seat. Polly Murray fights for social justice. A non-binary Black lawyer, activist, poet, and priest, Murray influences both Ruth Bader Ginsburg and Thurgood Marshall. So basically, Polly Murray was an alien that came down from outer space and influenced all these rad people. And we've never heard of her because why would you an American or any kind of history books? Right. And thank goodness for our friends, Betsy and Julie, for actually finding out about her while they were filming the Ruth Bader Ginsburg doc. Mm-hmm. And we were, first of all, really excited to talk with them again just yeah. because we had so much fun the first time and they do not disappoint. So you're going to hear us just having a lot of fun with our old friends and uh, we're hopefully going to have them on the show again soon because they just keep cranking them out. (laughs) Yeah, They do not stop. And thank God, because they're telling all the stories that we need to hear that, like Aaron said, our, our education system just is not up to par. So they've trailed us. (laughs) Yeah. We turn to filmmakers like this to, to teach us to fill in the gaps. We'll say. Yeah. But but yeah, uh, Polly Murray is incredible and incredible. I mean, there should be talk about statues. There need to be statues of this woman everywhere in our country. Like she's laid the groundwork for all of the great people that we admire and have on T-shirts and stickers. She laid the groundwork for them, whether they're a woman fighting for women's rights, gay rights, uh, black rights, like yeah. all of it. She laid the all of the rights religion, even um, she's more forward thinking than most religious leaders today. You know, right. and she was uh, a female minister. So. Yeah. yeah, just blown away by this film and hope you check it out now that it's streaming on a broader platform. Yeah, if you have Amazon, it's streaming uh, just opened up October 1st. Um, before we get into the interview with Betsy and Julie, uh, we have a few minutes to catch up. Uh, the last time we saw each other, right, was in L.A. Mm-hmm. Basic beaching, as yeah. Char put it. We were basic beaching and then driving very quickly to John Wayne Airport. Hauling ass <laughs> with leftover prime rib, which I'm eating right now. Don't judge me, everyone. That was that was your carry on. Yeah, it's a week later and now she's <sighs> eating the leftovers. But prime rib stays prime. That's why it's called prime. Yeah. And the dogs got a little I mean, everyone's a winner. <laughs> um, but I, I, you know, spoiler alert, I made my flight with some minutes to spare. I mean, thank goodness that airport is small. And it was a Wednesday mid afternoon. That's all. It's I a good say. airport. Yeah. 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 Named I after think- John Wayne, which is just so random, but it's sure. very so it's very SoCal. Yeah. Next, it's going to be Donald Trump. Um, shove it. Sorry. I'm sorry. Did I say that name on our podcast? You always have to take it there. I did. We're sorry. Trying to have fun right now. Um, I think and I think Ange has a couple things to say. And I know Shar has a story about her flight, oh, which good. I don't even know, but I'm already laughing. Oh, awesome. Well, I on the topic of Polly Murray and being revolutionary and still being a, a female minister of the church, 
Uh, I went to church my first mass since uh, oh, my, that's since right. my dad passed away, actually. So it's been but even when my dad passed away in December, I hadn't been to church in years and years and years. So the reason I went was because my grandmother, it was the um, anniversary of my grandmother's death. My grandmother that raised us, she raised all of us, all the kids in the family. And uh, she's passed. She passed away in 97, I believe. So it's been a while. But still, I mean, I think of her every day. She raised me, you know, mm. so um, my aunt in memory of uh, her death anniversary dedicated a mass to her in San Diego. And my mom wanted to go and everything my mom wants to do. I do because she wants to do such few things, the few things she wants. I'm like, I'm there. So I was like, okay, I'll go to mass. We spent the night in San Diego and this priest went on a rant about uh, being pro-life and how you can't be a Catholic and be pro-abortion, which I love it. I love when they say, pro-abortion um like uh it's just it, he went on and i started feeling like heat like my ears my my head started ringing and i was like i want to fucking leave right now what am i doing here but then i was like think of your grandma think of mama we called her think of her she raised you that's what i'm here for but i was like this is why i don't go to fucking church and then you know just to spite them i took that body of christ just because i was hungry i do not believe that was the body of christ I was just hungry. And I actually think the Eucharist tastes good. Char, do you agree? (laughs) It's kind of got this wafer crisp. It's like a Necco wafer, but not sweet. It's delicious. So fuck you. I ate that shit because I was hungry. That was not the body of Christ. Man, Never again. Of course. Of course, that was the homily that you had to listen to. I mean, they could have. It couldn't couldn't have been something else that was like about, you know, something that would have made you feel better. It had to be that. Yes. He could have talked about immigration. He was a a Mexican priest. He could have talked about immigration. We were in San Diego of all places. You know, he could have talked about so many other things that I actually believe in. But I think it was a sign from God telling me that I shouldn't go to church anymore. (laughs) So there's that. Anyway. But were you wearing your special necklace? You're I was really not. God damn it. You're right. Well, I was going on a trip with my family. I didn't bring the vibrator, but you know, oh. it is a beautiful necklace. I should just bring it everywhere. Yeah. Duly noted. Yeah. Can Shout I out um, to Chang at, at yeah. Love Crave for our Vesper vibrator? Yes. T Chang. <laughs> uh, good. Good job, Ange. I was just going to say to your point. And story about you going, you know, you haven't been to church, blah, 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 forever. And of course, this is the homily. I don't know anything about Catholicism. So thanks for spurting out some of the words, Shar. I don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> but um, my my good friend and oldest friend, Megan, and her family, a few Christmas Eves ago, whenever that was, went to church for their grandmother. Just because those are the times, you know, they showed up because <laughs> they're kind of they're Catholic light. And that priest he went on a rampage about on christmas eve about being pro-abortion and pro-life and they were like this is the last time we go and i think it was <laughs> i think it was the last time at least the three women went so her sister and her mom were just like uh-huh. yeah oh i didn't even yeah and he was like you know if you don't want to have the child you just give it up for adoption that's it what's the problem like oh really man yeah there's there's I mean what's the I, problem it's so easy you fucker oh god i, get, I was I guess, so mad i guess god really just doesn't want you guys to go to mass <laughs> because it's like it's like I, I i still go to mass and i don't remember the last time i got that beaten it beaten into my head about abortion and like all of that but maybe you, guys, you have a good pastor there are you, some really cool ones yeah, i remember I when go, i was a kid there was a cool one you guys used to go once in like 10 years <laughs> <laughs> wasn't me it wasn't me i didn't go the and lord Jason, works Jason, i'm a Jason. The lord works in mysterious ways but the one thing i will say is churches are really beautiful this was oh, one of those gorgeous. like spanish style mission style churches like I don't know, 20, 200 foot ceilings. I don't know how huge this church was. It was beautiful. I love looking at a church. I love being a Catholic church. church. I no, was... I love, I love, they're beautiful. Like yeah. the one over here at USF is gorgeous. Oh yeah. And where we uh, used to do yoga on Tuesdays. Oh, but that's not is, Catholic. It's more non-denominational. I love all inclusive, but not um, Grace Cathedral. Grace Cathedral. It is it's Grace yeah. Cathedral. Yeah. yeah. Back in the day. Oh, simpler times yeah but I, I like when we got there i was like wow it's beautiful and then i walked in and i was like <laughs> uh, uh. and then like your head exploded that's what exactly happened <laughs> yeah 
But I stand by the Eucharist is delicious. Good for you, Ange. Uh, Char, <laughs> before we wrap up this little mini basic, uh, what happened to you on your flight back from L.A. last week? I was the... And so glad... Oh, Char, so glad you're alive from that piece of glass that was in your glass at dinner again uh, last Tuesday because I have reflected a lot about that moment and fucked I don't up. know why we didn't say anything. Anyways, we fucked up. It, yeah. it, it, I mean, did your shit burn? Did you have yeah. some cuts coming yeah. out? Do, is you, your esophagus okay? There were like, some shards easily shards from that piece. Anyway, go on. Char, Char had shards mm -hmm. in her shard. Uh, Char sharded shards. <laughs> Jesus. OK, OK. Oh, um, it's funny that you are um, eating our prime rib dinner from last week because uh, I don't know. Do, we didn't think we talked about this on the basic on the on the beach is that we you know, we had all these leftovers. Aaron and I and are getting all, in, yeah, and we're getting on a plane, <laughs> and, and we, we have, rushed to repack your bag in the trunk of my car. So, we didn't so even that's talk and, about and, that. yeah, and Aaron doesn't even know that is that as <laughs> oh, I, I told her this a little bit the last time we talked <laughs> is that uh, we dropped Aaron off at because she had her flight right away. Mine was like a couple hours away. We get to uh, to my terminal. We opened up and we're like, oh, it's not busy. Okay, let's repack, and and Angie's like. Do you she, do you want to take your your uh, your blind spotting uh, blanket? Aaron did. <laughs> Aaron opted not to take hers, and I was like, "Oh, I wasn't going to take mine either, but maybe I can." And then she's like, "Oh, well, we can repack your stuff right now. There's nobody here, so we're like repacking." I'm an expert packer, by the way. So you say. <laughs> Oh, oh shit. yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> I Tetris that shit. Did the food? Oh no. So so the so we had the bag and we had this and then we even we, you and I even <laughs> talked about that. We go, Angela looked at me and goes, Do you want to stuff it in here? The bag might break. And I'm like, oh, we could try it. And so we um, we have the no. we have the brown bag. <laughs> we have the brown bag. We have the food at the bottom. <laughs> we put the blanket on the top. It fits perfectly. Oh, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> and so, so I'm like, all right, cool. And then, so I, I go, I check in my bag. Oh, no. I check in my bag. I, I I have my stuff. Remember, I had the the rock star. I drank my rock star before I crossed the security gate. I carried my stuff into security and went through security all fine. I looked at it when it went through security. I was like, oh, it's a little flimsy, but I'm just going to the gate. It'll be fine. <laughs> That's the last famous words, right? It'll be fine. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, so I get, I get to the <laughs> gate. I go to the bar and to the restaurant that's right next to it. There's a little bar restaurant right next to it. I get a couple of drinks there and I'm just, so I'm just sitting. All good, sitting pretty, and then it's time for me to board my board my plane. I get up, and all of a sudden, it's like, <laughs> oh no, the horseradish sauce. No, no, the, all the, the sauces. Well, so the everything is still at the bottom. But the I'm worried bag, about the sauces, by the but way. The bag okay. is <laughs> the bag is dead. Like, starting to die like it has like a big rip on the side of it and then so i was like and then i'm like walking so then i'm like i got like five minutes i walk up and down the uh, the, the gate the nearby gates to see if i can find a place where i can get a bag like any kind of bag a plastic bag but i'm like i'm not going to so i have to hug it right <laughs> <laughs> so, so I, I get on the plane hugging this this emporium brown bag with prime rib at the bottom of it and a blind spotting blanket what else was in there i feel like there was more, weren't there two sets of leftovers yeah or was the, it only the, the potato <laughs> <laughs> The big potato was in a separate <laughs> container because it was so big. <laughs> so. This is like a five pound potato. Yeah, everyone guys. that's listening. Come it's on. It's like a really big potato. <laughs> and there's like three sauces. There's the horseradish sauce. 
the prime rib dipping like <sighs> au jus. So, so and yeah. then this, this, I, I'm getting on the plane and you know, it's Southwest. <laughs> you have to get first come first serve. So I'm like, get on the plane, <laughs> I'm like running. get on the plane. I need a place to put my bag. And I was like, I'm, so, I'm like, I'm so stupid hugging my bag. So it won't, it won't rip anymore. <laughs> You're hugging your leftovers. <laughs> You're like, I can fit the potato here and the prime rib there. <laughs> so so the bag is still intact. The blind spotting bag is the, <sighs> the blind spotting. The blind spotting blanket is in there. I get in. I get to the back of the plane because I'm like, I'm going to be the last one off of this thing. I'm not going to watch. Let everybody watch me. Right. <laughs> I'll go to the back. Thank you. So, so I went all the way to the back, found an empty thing. I put it up there. Oh, I had my sweatshirt in there. I put my sweatshirt in there. Did that. Went to my seat. Went to sleep. Had a great flight back. When I sat down, actually, I looked at the floor and I saw <laughs> the handle. The handle. <laughs> the handle went down. <laughs> <laughs> it ripped off and it was on the floor of the plane. <laughs> oh my god. Oh the <laughs> so I'm like, oh my god, oh. what's it gonna look like when I oh. open that? And then of course the plane takes off and, and then you know, like when you land and when you land and you could hear like all the stuff rumbling up top and I'm like, oh my <laughs> the <God."> sauces, the <laughs> potato. <laughs> I, I, was like, I was looking up, I'm going, what's happening? <laughs> and so oh. every, everybody gets off of the plane. Everybody gets off of the plane. There's more to this. Oh God. Okay. I yeah. open it up. I pull it out and it's like the bag is like just tattered. There's no more handles. <laughs> it's like ripped and free. And then the, the, here you are, Ange. The sauce is leaked. I knew it. Oh, God but damn it, it. But it didn't leak. It didn't leak so much that it was uh, that it actually, no, it wasn't the sauces. It was it was the prime rib juice. <laughs> So oh, gross. That is so fucking gross. So, you know, like, oh the, my God. <laughs> sorry, the brown, the brown paper bag at the corners, you could see a little bit of the, you know, like it's like, oh, like, I know like that wet. look. And yeah. I'm like, what the fuck am I going to do with this thing? And so I take it out and then I look at my sweatshirt. My sweatshirt had it's you know what it was? My sweatshirt had absorbed all the juices. <laughs> I thought you said the blind I thought you were gonna say the blind spotting blanket absorbed <laughs> all that's, the that's, juice. That's, that's oh what God. I that's what I was afraid of. I was like, oh I can ruin I my blind spotting blanket didn't even survive. It was ruined, but it wasn't. It was my sweatshirt. And I'm oh. like, well, that's gonna have to go straight to the to to the wash after that. So I pull it out. So and the how bag, did you? Yeah, the bag is just no more. Like, at least when I got on the plane, at least it still had handles. There were no more <laughs> handles. There was a rip down the middle. <laughs> so I had to and like it. wet stains everywhere, <laughs> like so I, juice stains. So I had to take the thing and hug it again. And get off of this thing, hugging this thing so it wouldn't fall apart anymore. <laughs> and I'm like, and then of course, you know when you get off the plane, <laughs> there's all these people that are getting ready to get on the plane, <laughs> and I'm the last one off the plane. They probably were <laughs> waiting for you. There's like, right. there's one more person. I'm so sorry. I don't know what so, she's doing. So I'm walking. I'm walking off of it like this. <laughs> <laughs> protecting my my prime, prime rib, rib and baked potato and my blanket when my and my blood soaked sweatshirt oh God. i really i You're really like, what happened to her? i really <laughs> hope you enjoyed those leftovers like did you eat every bite and just like oh oh yeah you but, had to fucking but, earn so, that so, so what so this is what i was like i need to find a i need i was like i need to find where am I going to put this? I'm not going to carry this all the way to the other to get my bag and everything else. So I as soon as I got off the plane, I went to the seats at the at the gate. Took the bag. The bag was shredded and gross <laughs> and whatever. 
<laughs> so I just crumpled it up and threw it away. I took my sweatshirt, which was already kind of a mess anyways, and I took the two leftover containers and wrapped it in my bag, or wrapped it in my sweatshirt and just tied it up and, you know, Smart. in a bow. So, mm -hmm. and then I took the blind spotting, blind spotting blanket and I undid it. And then I put the, the, the blanket in, around and then I rolled it over and then I, I collapsed it with its little elastic clasp. Smart. And That's then, and then I had, and then I, and then I had a, a little handle. And then that's how I got through the rest of my oh. trip. <laughs> Good blind spotting saves again. There you can go. You, can you believe the amount of stories we've gotten from these fucking blankets? You no, know, I just, it's, it's the gift that keeps on yeah, giving. Yeah, I still don't have mine, even though I could have taken it. <laughs> oh my God. Oh my God. Well, that was hilarious. Thank you. Okay, I, I just have to asterisk. It has nothing to do with my pack job because no, don't, you know, no. it was the integrity. It was the integrity of the bag. That was yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, I was like one of like I just I had just wished. I mean, like there, if I just had one, if we had double bagged or if I had at least had a plastic, like if I had met Disneyland bag that I had used. Yes, that I bought like that was in. the. I had another plastic bag in the car, too, that we could like if I did use. like 45 bags in the car, <laughs> like if I did, if I had that, reusable that, bags, yeah, that would have totally saved me. But again, God works in mysterious ways. He wanted me to have a story for this. And it ripped. Yeah. <laughs> like you went the whole way to the bar and it didn't rip. Jesus, literally. Oh, God, I'm crying. That's yeah. hilarious. Uh, Thank you. That was fucking funny. I knew it was going to be funny when I told it to you. I was like, I, I getting off the bag. It's like, it's this. Oh, actually, good. I have a bag with me. I don't know how you stopped yourself from it not me texting like this. me this, Char. Like, <laughs> she couldn't. So... She had to hold the bag, Ange. No, I can't believe you didn't text me and tell me because we repacked her bag and shoved all this shit in her check in and like, we thought we had it good. Oh my God. And, I, and I was like, well, I didn't have that many places to go. Where did I go? It was this direct flight. It's like I went to the gate and right. how did the handle fly off mid flight? That's the <laughs> Dude, what I saw. It was like the handle was like, I'm out of here. Uh, yeah, it sucks. <laughs> oh, my God. Bloody sweatshirt. I mean, seriously. Uh, well, oh, uh, that's good. Thanks for catching us up. Char, uh, I hate to cut you off, but you have to go. Um, and anyways, here's our interview from Sundance earlier this year with oh, yeah. West and Julie Cohen <laughs> talking about their film, Paul, uh, My Name is Polly Murray, which is streaming right now on Amazon. Watch it. We love them. Hey, bitches. What's up, friend? <laughs> hey, how are you? Oh, I, I have guys. such a strong memory of actually being in like a hotel suite in San Francisco where we had done like a ton of interviews that were all very straight and boring. And then you guys came in with your big talk energy. And we were like, oh, like now I'm awake. Oh, <laughs> we're like, yeah. ta-da. Like, the we, bitches are here. Yeah, yes, we yeah. remember it fondly too. We, yeah. we look back to that all the time. It was so, so fun. And we've been waiting for this moment ever since. So yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But uh, Julie, we saw you in 2019 at that at the uh, what, what was it? Um, Planned Parenthood brunch. Yeah, like right. a minute. At the Planned Parenthood part. And you yelled, stuff, right? "There's my bitches yeah. from across the room." It yeah, was so, <laughs> <laughs> it was so special. We were like us. <laughs> of course, we turn. We know. We're like, yeah. oh, who knows? <laughs> <Sweet friends. laughs> right. yeah. You're not together in a suite right now. You're. No, we're far, yeah. far away. We're far, far away from each other. It's are you we in are, but we, I'm in San Francisco. I'm in Southern California right now with my family uh -huh. for a little bit. But uh -huh. yeah, still posted in San Francisco. Yeah. 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 We have been following you all along. And, yes. and every time we see that you've done something, like your accomplishments feel like successes for all of us. So yeah. the, <laughs> the, the video for Dr. Jill Biden, I'm going to say doctor every time I say her yes, name. Please. Yes, please. The doctor. Dr. Jill. 
<laughs> the video you guys did at the DNC, Aaron and I were texting like, did you watch it? Did you watch it? Which is, <laughs> it was amazing. Just everything you guys are, touch. You, you guys get every time you guys are in the news, you're in our Slack or our yeah. group. Text. Always. Yeah. Always. <laughs> <laughs> Always. Like, look what they're doing. Look what they're doing. They're so cool. Oh, my God. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh my I God. guess we- that's who is like, the only people who think we're cool. There's oh. people, <laughs> many people like our work, but not many people. I'm going to close the door. My husband's across the hallway, and I think he like might be like really shocked right now. <laughs> anyway, yeah, we're happy to be back with you. We're very happy. We are at Sundance 2021, everybody. I'm Erin from Bitch Talk. I have my co-host, Angela Tabora. Uh, we're also representing Films Gone Wild, and we have the wonderful Julie Cohen and Betsy West from the documentary. My name is Polly Murray. Um, Ange, I'm going to let you start first because there's a lot to talk about with this film. Yeah, I, well, I, I have to start by saying we've brought this up all the time on Bitch Talk, how our education system is very Eurocentric. And even when they do, even when it does come to stories of other cultures, they even get that wrong. And there's major <laughs> gaps, including Polly Murray. So how did you come across uh, this beautiful woman and and how did you decide to tell her story? Well, um, you ladies will be happy to know that it was RBG who first mm. put us on to Polly Murray because uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, as a lawyer arguing for women's rights, had put Polly Murray's on name on the cover of the first brief that that she wrote before the Supreme Court because of an article that Polly Murray had written in the 1960s arguing about using the 14th Amendment to fight for women's rights. So, you know, we knew that, but we didn't know much more, frankly. After RBG, we did a little bit of research and just went, holy moly, mm -hmm. look at this person and had the same feeling that you did. Like, I, I didn't know about her. How come I didn't know about this extraordinary uh, thinker, activist, <laughs> influencer. Uh, so we just thought, hey, let's let's go for it. And and when you started digging into this film and in the history of Polly Murray and started pitching it, were were other people surprised by the story? Yes, I mean I think that was a pretty universal reaction we got. Um, not only you know in terms of going out for looking for funding for the film, but also bringing on other members of the team. Um, you know, like, how do I not know more about this person? Once people understand what Polly contributed, you know, in legal thinking to women's rights and to civil rights in, you know, this amazing body of poetry and nonfiction writing, um, in spirituality, becoming the first um, black per I, black person identified as a woman to be uh, to be ordained as an Episcopal priest, um, you know, activism like desegregating restaurants in Washington D.C. in 1943, like 17 years before the Woolworths lunch counter sit in, getting arrested for sitting in the quote unquote white section of a bus in 1940, 19, uh, 15 years before Rosa Parks arrest, like like thing after thing, and you're like how did I not know this? Um, which just sort of seemed like a kind of challenge to us of like, okay, well, let's figure out if there's a way to tell this person's story, dis despite, you know, unlike RBG, uh, such a vibrant on-camera presence um, that, that, that who we filmed for RBG, obviously this is someone who died 35 years ago. We're not gonna have that aspect to it on top of a name that isn't a household name. Um, but like, you know, I think it was, but, but you know, that's kind of part of the story. Like, why don't we, why don't we know mm -hmm. who Polly Murray is? Which is why, what was the impetus between the title? Like, my name is Polly Murray. <laughs> like, hello, Intr introducing myself here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think that the, the way that you tell the story and, and you introduce these different things that she did, like 15 years before Rosa Parks did this, mm -hmm. 10 years before RBG, it really, it really hits home that impact of there's something wrong here. And, and I hope that sets the bigger discussion for how we teach children and how we talk about our history. I, I really do. I, I really hope this, this film is shown throughout schools across the country and the world, really. 
Is that a conversation that you've been having or? or <laughs> yeah, we hope that we hope that, too. I mean, I think that was our our primary goal. And, you know, we were extraordinarily lucky uh, that Polly saved everything. I, yes. As her, as her great niece discovered after Polly's death. And it was every single piece of writing and letters and diaries and interviews and everything that went to the amazing Schlesinger Library at Harvard, where, you know, we had the pleasure of being in the vault there to see the Polly Murray collection, which is huge. It's, mm -hmm. you know, nearly 150 boxes, but, you know, along with all, with other great American women whose archives are there. And, you know, we, we discovered that the photographs that Polly had saved over the years and these audio tapes, and that allowed us to try to bring stories, Polly's story to life in a very personal way. I mean, you know, it was a, it's, a, it's a fascinating and complex story. Polly was a feisty, determined, brilliant woman who had many ups and downs in life, along with the incredible challenge of being a non-binary person at a time when that was just like unknown or not, if not unknown, just unacceptable to most people. Mm -hmm. And that was a really hard challenge. So, um, you know, we, we were able to, you know, move forward with this material. Can I ask about the non-binary um, and gender story that is a really big part of Polly's story? Was there ever a moment where it was questionable for you two to, to, to shine a light on it? Yes, we went into the project not really knowing or fully understanding to what extent we were going to get into that subject matter. Unlike um, the fight for racial equality, the fight for gender equity, uh, uh, fighting for gay rights or trans rights um, was not part of Polly's public struggle, wasn't something mm -hmm. that Polly talked about publicly at all. Um, following the work of one of the authors we interview in the film, Rosalind Rosenberg, who, who wrote pretty extensively about that subject, and then also looking ourselves in Polly's archives, in which there's not a ton of information, but there is certainly Polly left in, in an archive for future students and researchers to see um, these unbelievably poignant plaintive letters to doctors going back to 1940 saying, you know, in stumbly language, because like, you know, just say like, I, I think I'm a man, like, can, or, or can, can I take testosterone? Because Polly had read an article um, in, a, in a newspaper, uh, I think was even in the late 30s, talking about how people could take testosterone, not necessarily as a gender reassignment thing, but for other purposes. And it seemed like, oh, that could be relevant, saying like, wait, can, can somebody do surgery on me and tell mm -hmm. me if there are male organs inside me? Um, you know, so much of Polly's words that are in the film that are recorded on audio or video or in, are written in, in letters and, and journals feel like they're kind of like a cry to be heard. Like, I want you to, as, as my grandniece says in the film, like, you, I, I want you to see me. I want you to hear me. And that seemed like part of the Polly story that was maybe like a cry to be heard, even if it was a cry into the future. Yeah. And I think we agreed with Polly's biographer, Rosalind Rosenberg, that Polly's in-betweenness, uh, the fact that Polly uh, was a non-binary person and also Polly's in-betweenness racially, mixed race, um, as a woman in a male, you know, traditionally male profession. I mean, in many ways, Polly was an outsider. And, and I think, you know, Rosalind's uh, argument was that this was key to who Polly was and allowed Polly to make the discoveries that Polly did about the arbitrariness of categories for women, for African Americans, for any kind of, um, you know, arbitrary pigeonholing was just mm. didn't make any sense to her. And, and that was, so her personal life really informed 
the amazing professional accomplishments that that Polly had. Yeah, I'm glad you talk about that because, you know, and, and that's even with her work for social justice in conjunction with her deep religiousness that even RBG, you know, was was kind of baffled by. And, and it, it happens all the time. It's just like we're the religious right. And if you're liberal, you can't have that. Like there's room for all of it. The, the difference is our acceptance of that. Uh, and, and so I'm, I'm really glad that, that you touch on that. And one thing that really stuck with me that, that she says is um, she hopes, I'm quoting, that I live to see my lost causes found. Yeah. That, yeah. that really has stuck with me um, because it's just, it's just she had that outlook. That's why she was able to do these things. It's not a lost cause because it's impossible. It just hasn't been found yet. Right. And uh, you both have covered Ruth Bader Ginsburg, <laughs> Polly Murray, Dr. Jill Biden. She's a doctor, everybody. Um, after covering these brilliant women, has it changed what you think it takes to be a trailblazer like that? Do you think it takes a special something? Do we all have that in us, that ability to make these huge impacts? Well, the three people that you've mentioned um, have, have some things in common. And um, I would say just like a relentless optimism you know, hmm. not not someone who's never sad or depressed, but just like relentlessly, I'm gonna push through whatever her ba barriers anyone puts in my way. Like having that kind of mindset. I mean, Polly more than any of these other characters had the, like the the height of the wall constantly being put in in front of her. And as as Polly says um, in a 1970 interview that we th that we listened to, um, you know, it's like the bar keeps being raised. I get, I mean, the, the number of degrees <laughs> that this yeah. person had was just like incredible. Like, you know, so many accomplishments, so much. I mean, you, you don't even know that we got, so we have so many firsts in the film, there are so many more. And yet, you know, when it comes time to go for tenure, like the tenure committee is like, yeah, but you know, you're not really brilliant. <laughs> yeah. Like, uh, yeah. you know, just like no matter how far you go, someone's going to put a wall up. But like Polly was just going to scale that and and jump over it because of the, the level of uh, not give upness in, you know, instilled in deep in that spirit. You know, and, and I think something that Polly's lover early on said is struck with me. Polly, she said, you know, I, I can't believe you can write about being a Negro and not be bitter. How can you do that? And I think that, you know, Polly's writings are tough and fierce and she's taking FDR to task. And, yes. you know, she's <laughs> in confrontation by typewriter, but there isn't bitterness there. There is just determination to to, to jump over that wall and to, to keep going. And, uh, you know, that's something that, that served Polly very well. Yeah. And I was going to say, um, I do love the story because I kind of, it resonates with me of um, Polly and her students and that she would keep using the word Negroes <laughs> and they would cringe a little bit, but they really <laughs> respected her. <laughs> And I, I get that curmudgeon, uh, curmudgeonly aspect of her because I'm like that too. But I loved that story yeah. and thank yeah. you for including it. <laughs> yeah, pa Polly's uh, students at Brandeis um, were uh, really uh, amazing people uh, and hearing them sort of growing to recognize um, everything that Polly was, you know, it's easy for a college student to look at a 50 year old professor and you know they were radical activists at that time and the the teacher is like you know work within the system and it sort of e it would have been easy for them to dismiss her um the person that they knew to be a, they knew as a woman professor but like they they were able to see, you know, like spend a few, uh, a few weeks in that classroom and you start to understand, wait a second, there's really something extraordinary that this person has to bring. And I think a lot of that had to do with the human connection that Polly gave, that it became clear that uh, Professor Murray was looking at them as human beings with a ton of potential and was going to help uh, 
bring them bring them along educationally and then all of a sudden you care about someone and you trust them and you start to want to know more about their history and what they've contributed and that's you know they came to really understand Polly very very deeply I think yeah for for people like Polly who have achieved greatness they're always going to say you know I, I I didn't do this alone I, I did this with as a group but I, but I want to bring up Aunt Pauline and her, mm. her relationship with her, you know, who she just gave her unconditional love. She's someone that she really needed as, as part of her foundation to give her the strength to do what she then mo- moved on to do. So I, I really feel like we should all try to be like Polly Murray, but we should also try to be Aunt Pauline to, to everyone around us to, to, to give that strong foundation for these people around us that can achieve this greatness. Yeah, I mean, Aunt Pauline is a great character, and I wish we could have spent more time on Aunt Pauline because she took in this or her orphan niece and did give unconditional love and ultimately understood uh, that Polly's, you know, to some extent under, understood uh, Polly's gender struggle, you know, called her my, my boy girl, you know, mm-hmm. really... Mm-hmm. didn't make her feel bad because wanted to dress as a boy and not as not as a girl and then as that went on I mean Paul Aunt Pauline was was an extraordinary person and and really I think gave Polly the foundation uh, to meet the the challenges that she did in her life on that note, we have to wrap, but it was such a pleasure seeing you two again, Julie Cohen and Betsy West. Um, congratulations on the film, and I'm sure we'll be seeing more of you two uh, as 2021 rolls on. Thanks, Harry. Right. Thanks, Angela. Thank you. So we love you guys. Thank you. Yeah, you too. Thank you. If you like what you hear, rate and subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. For more information about us, you can head to bitchtalkpodcast.com. This podcast is created, hosted, and executive produced by Aaron Lim. My co-host is Angela Tabora, a.k.a. Captain Party. The show's edited by producer Shar. We're powered by GoTo Productions. <laughs>